In your Bibles, if you'll please turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter. The 10th chapter, Gospel of Luke. We'll go from verses 1 to 16 today. As we consider the Lord's ambassadors. You know, we're told that when we know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we are his ambassadors. We are representatives of King Jesus in a foreign land. <laughs> That's what ambassadors do, don't they? They represent the government. They represent that king in another land. And you know, we're not to be too comfortable here because the Bible says, we're just passing through. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we have that longing and we look forward and to understand. So we see the Lord's ambassadors in chapter 10 and verse 1. First of all, the calling of the Savior. Pastor Paul Chapel in his uh, commentary or his, his outline commentary on the Gospel of Luke called Journey with Jesus does a good job of having the same letters here in some of these points and so a lot of the points have come from that commentary outline. The calling of the Savior first of all is the commission of the laborers. The Bible says, now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs of ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Now these are not apostles, but he has sent out 70, or some manuscripts say 72, to go out to prepare the way where he's going to be going. And he sends them out, but he commissions them. He sends them out with a purpose as they go out. And they're representing Jesus Christ, the Lord, that will be coming later on. And as they go to these every city and place where he was going to come, we see the calculation of the laborers. Jesus was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I've never heard of a mission agency that says, we have enough missionaries. Or definitely, we don't have you don't hear him say, we have too many. <laughs> Why? The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. And here is still something that we are to do today. Beseech or pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send out the laborers into the field. To pray, Lord, the harvest is plentiful. There are many in this message of grace, the good news, what the choir was singing, the glorious message of the blood. The glorious message that there is forgiveness of sins available. There is salvation through Jesus Christ. People in every country of every different language need to hear this glorious news. The harvest is plentiful. But, oh, Lord, the laborers are few. So we would ask, and even as the Lord is sending me 70 out ahead of him to go and carry the message that the kingdom of God is at hand or is near. You know, the ones asking are going to be workers, but they're asking the Lord for more. Send out more. 
The other day I was listening to the Southern Baptist evangelist, Dr. Bailey Smith, in a message shortly before his death. And as Dr. Bailey Smith was preaching boldly the Word of God and saying, you know, he said the reality is it's not a ton of new churches, but people to take the gospel and carry out the, the good news and going forth. Now, new churches where there are not ones currently, new churches to go out and, and to saturate and to go and, and present the gospel to those that are not hearing. That's what the Lord is saying, go out. He's got the concern for the laborers, verses three and four. He says, go, behold, I send you as lambs in the midst of wolves. He says, carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes. Now they would have shoes on, but he says, I don't take an extra pair. And greet no one on the way. Now, we read that and say, well, wait a second. Why weren't they to be greeting? This greeting was not just a, hello, how are you doing? It would be a long and even sometimes involving a meal. But it would carry them away from the purpose of their going out. And the vast need and what they're going to be doing in preparing the way. So the concern, their mission was dangerous. Vance Havner, a great statement that he made, he was talking about any man who takes Jesus Christ seriously becomes the target of the devil. Any man who takes Jesus Christ seriously, and remember what Jesus was talking about, if anybody's gonna be my disciple, gonna come after me, they're going to deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. The ones who are serious about that, the reality is, becomes the target of the devil. Vance Havner went on and said, most church members do not give Satan enough trouble to arouse his opposition. He would already have them where he wants them. Complacent. Silent not concerned about people's souls. In fact, they were to travel light. The urgency of the mission did not allow for the elaborate greetings that was typical of that time. But now we see the commands of the Savior when greeting others. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. Now we know the word shalom, and it's not just the absence of war. It's the idea of blessing be upon this house. The Lord's blessing be on them. And so there was the idea behind even shalom that would be stated. So whatever house you enter, first say peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. And then you see, stay in the house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. When you have gone and they received you and there's peace in that house, you stay there, you eat there in that time that you're there. You're not to be going from house to house. He said the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving, but whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you. I had friends that were missionaries in the Philippines for a number of years, and they, would, they were in so many different countries around the world. They uh, were serving with Teen Missions International, and they would be in all these different countries. And, and you know what? My, my friends said, we ate what was set before us and we didn't ask a lot of questions. Because there were times we didn't know really what we were reading. But I, he said, I don't think we wanted to know. 
We just ate it. Now, I have to be honest, I kind of struggle with that. I, I want to know what I'm eating. And here, they're to eat what is set before them. And then he says, in that house, heal those in it who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Because who is going to be coming after them? Jesus Christ himself. The kingdom of God is near you. He's coming, has come near to you. So that is to the ones that would receive them. But what about the ones that don't? There's always unbelief, isn't there? What if those will reject and will not believe the message, will not receive you, will not be hospitable and welcoming you? What do you do? Well, he goes on in verse 9 and 10, or verse 10, whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. It's a warning, isn't it? You're rejecting, you're not believing, but let me tell you, he is coming, the king is coming. And even the dust of your city, that, that, so we, they would wipe him off of the feet as a sign. In verse 12, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Remember in the book of Genesis that Sodom and Gomorrah, how God judged those wicked cities? And actually, in the book of Ezekiel, it says uh, the, the, the sin of pride that was in the city, but then all the sorts of immorality and all that was taking place, God judged those cities greatly. And he said, it'll be easier, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom in those days than these cities that have rejected the message, that have rejected the word. What happens to the person who hears over the years, time after time, the gospel? And when there would be a, the Holy Spirit convicting and they ignore the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in them. And as the, they're ignoring the work of the Spirit and just become, and they hear and become calloused. And Jesus talked about greater judgment. Those that would hear. How about the unbelieving Jews of Jesus' day that handled the scriptures but would not believe in Jesus Christ? Oh, they were religious, religious, but they were lost. There are many today that think that they have salvation by the efforts, by the things that they can do, by religious works. But here's the reality. They don't know Jesus. They're going to be spending an eternity in hell apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, indeed, the Lord is a Lord of love, but he also has a righteous, just wrath that will be poured out upon those who reject him. So we see when rejected, in a sense, the Lord's saying, leave the judgment to me. We're not to avenge, are we? Receive vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We're not to try to seek the vengeance. Did any of you raise, uh, did you, any of you grow up with a, a brother or a sister that was really ornery? 
and love to play practical jokes and pranks. I, I have a dear brother that's three and a half years older than me, and he would always play these jokes on me. And I'll be honest with you, I could never get him back. I didn't even try because I couldn't do it. I don't know how he pulled this one off. I met one time I was a student at Otterbein in the education course, and my brother wasn't even living at the house. In some way, he set one of those little alarms in my book bag, and so I took it to school, and it was an early class at Otterbein, and that stupid alarm goes off. And I'm not even sitting, I, I'm in doing group work over here and my, my backpack or book bag isn't even near me. It's, and this one girl from Sunbury from Big Walnut comes over and carrying that book bag and said, Brian, there's something beeping in your, in your book bag. I'm thinking, I don't have a beeper. And the professor say, somebody not want to oversleep this morning? And as soon as I got home, he knows exactly, and my brother calls and says, how was your day? I said, you're not even funny. And that was one of the more milder jokes. But you know, when we think about, not just with the, the aspect of a, a joke or a prank, but when somebody's hurt us deeply and we say, oh, if I could just let them feel some of that pain, that they've caused. The Lord says, don't avenge. Don't avenge. Leave the judgment to me. Go to verses 13 through 16 to see the condemnation of the Savior. The word woe is so important, isn't it? We see the Lord Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin. We, woe to you, Bethsaida, cities in, Gal in Galilee. For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, these were wicked cities in the Old Testament, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth, and ashes. These cities in which there have been great works, where there have been miracles and teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they are unbelieving, will not place their trust, will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, woe to you. Judgment is coming. You are held to account. You are held to account. Verse 15, and it, and you, Capernaum. Now what was interesting about Capernaum is even though Jesus was born in Nazareth and grew up there, the basis, the home base of his Galilean ministry was Capernaum. So in the home base, and there were great miracles done in Capernaum, there were great teachings there that he says, even though you have heard all this and you've seen the miracles, you've seen this, woe to you. You will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. That's the Greek word used for Sheol in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. The Hades is the sense of a place awaiting final judgment a place of destruction, of torments. You'll be brought down in a sense to hell, to Hades. When we think about so oftentimes people will do exactly as Paul was reasoning with Felix. Remember in the book of Acts, the Bible says that Paul reasoned with Felix about righteousness, about judgment to come. And it says that Felix was afraid. He had a response. He had a response. He was afraid. 
There was a sense of conviction there. But he said, go away for now. For some other convenient time, I will call for you and hear you concerning these matters. Now, we never, are, we never read in the Bible where this Felix came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The last we see, he was in unbelief, wasn't he? Some other time. And then the Bible said, at other times he would call for Paul, hoping a bribe would be paid to him. He was hoping that Paul would try to give him money. So what happened to his heart? Hardened. This is very serious as Jesus is teaching. The woes to these cities in which great miracles and teachings were done, but overall, the people were in unbelief, even as he shared. USA Today published an article on September the 3rd, 2002, entitled, Delay Meant Death on 9-11, that reported on those who escaped the World Trade Center on 9-11. After interviewing over 300 survivors and family members of victims, the paper concluded that in the South Tower, those who immediately ran for safety without delay are the ones who survived. Those who delayed perished. The spiritual life is much the same. Those who delay, delay to make a commitment to Jesus Christ often wait until it is too late. So many in these cities said, show us more. We will not believe. Show us something else. But you know what Jesus said? Even if he did all these other miracles, Right before them, they wouldn't believe. They would not believe. Verse 16, the witness of the 70. Jesus said, the one who listens to you listens to me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. In this same Gospel of Luke, would you go over to chapter 16, Luke 16? You might remember the truth of the, the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man is in torments. Remember what the rich man is begging to have done? Verse 27 of Luke 16. He said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Jesus said to him, or he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. If they will listen to you, what you're saying, they will believe in me, but if they reject the very message, then they are rejected that they will not even believe my Father who sent me. 
Now the rich man is thinking, oh, my brothers will believe if somebody comes to them that has risen from the dead and proclaims. And it's taught very clearly. If they will not believe what Moses and the prophets had to say about Jesus Christ, even in Jesus Christ himself goes and would rise from the grave and would go to them, they still will not believe him. They would reject him, wouldn't they? So many times when we think about this, people rejecting the word of God, the teachings of the scriptures, will not believe, will not listen. It's not that the Holy Spirit isn't convicting, isn't convincing them, but people have a choice. People all the time. Respond either, either positively to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit and say, you know, yes, I am a guilty sinner. I deserve damnation because of my sins. And yes, Jesus did die on the cross on the, for my sins. And he was buried and he rose again the third day, just like he said. But there are others that hear the same gospel presentation and they will say, no, I'm just fine. I'm really not that bad of a person. You ever watch where somebody goes out and asks questions to people, especially in college towns or in various, various places, and ask them uh, spiritual questions? Or ask them, you know, what do you think you had to do to go to heaven? And a lot of times the reply is, well, I, I'm a pretty good person. I think I can go to heaven. And then when the Bible truth is presented to them, they have a choice, don't they? Many of them say, I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. It's not impossible for older people to come to know the Lord, but I tell you one of the things that's a challenge is that the older people get and they think, well, I'm doing, I'm doing okay. I, I'm don't, I don't need Christ. I, I'm doing okay. And they could be good and moral people. But friend, do you realize that there's going to be a lot of good moral people in hell? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. The whole question is this. What do you do with Jesus? What do you do? That is why Jesus is considered so divisive. You ever noticed... You know, in Washington, D.C., after the tragedies, they would have the services and they would have all these different religions and they would say, oh, you, you can say God, but don't you dare say Jesus. After 9-11, it was, it was amazing. They, they, they played that glorious hymn and sang, a mighty fortress is our God, but they left out the verse that would refer to the name Jesus. Oh, was that by accident? No. You can talk about God when you get all together, but don't mention Jesus. Even though he is God, don't mention Jesus because he's too divisive. What happens? There are some who will believe in him, but many will reject him and not believe. But they were the Lord's ambassadors. Before we have communion together today, as we would conclude this passage, this message, I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Friend, I really believe that this, <laughs> there are so many important passages, obviously, in the Bible. But this is such a crucial passage for us to grasp and to truly understand what the Apostle Paul is saying because he's saying it about every one of us that knows the Lord. He's saying this about us. We have a tendency to think somebody else will tell them. They need to hear about Jesus. Somebody else will speak to them. 
Let's be honest. Have you ever done that? I have. They need to hear about Jesus. Somebody will tell them. What about you? It's not by accident that God has placed you into a, a sphere of influence in that person's life. Maybe it's a neighbor, a family mate, a member, a coworker. Somebody that you see consistently. It's a stewardship, a relationship that the Lord has given you. Verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Who did he give that to? Not just the preacher. He gave it to us, the ministry. Here's the reality. You will have opportunities to lead people to Jesus Christ that I never will. You'll have an impact on people way more than what I could ever have. That God has given each one of us the ministry of reconciliation. I remember telling a guy that got saved at the Bible study in the jail years ago, Licking County Justice Center, he was going off to prison to serve a, a prison term. He had come to know Jesus. And you know what his last Bible study he was going to be there in Newark for? I, I, I told him this, I looked right to him and I said, here's the reality. You can share the good news of Jesus Christ with others that I would never meet. And one of the goals was to teach them how to be able to take and, and, and to share Jesus with others. To tell them, you know what's the most powerful thing? Their story. What the Lord had done with them. And how the Lord had changed them. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and was raised on the third day, just like he said. The glorious good news. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, friend, there's not a sign-up sheet. Where you say, okay, I'll sign up to be an ambassador. No, he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. This is very important. Who's making the appeal? God is. You know what we are? The instruments. The vessels that God uses. Not that God has to use us, but he chooses to use us. He chooses to use the redeemed to carry the message of redemption. He chooses to use the ones who have received forgiveness to share the message that there's a God who loves you and who will forgive you of your sins. He chooses to use us. That's amazing, isn't it? He says, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see, God is working, speaking through us. He is working in the recipient and the one that is hearing us. He is working through the Holy Spirit. He is working in their heart, convicting them of sin. 
And here is the glorious truth. Verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Henry Blackaby in his devotional on experiencing God wrote, this verse should startle us and cause us to tremble. It is not a verse to be read quickly and passed over. As Christians, we are grateful to be forgiven of our sins. We are thankful we have been adopted as God's children. Yet we will never comprehend the awesome price that Jesus paid to cleanse us of our sin and to give us his righteousness. How abhorrent was it for the sinless Son of God to have every sin of humanity placed upon him. What love was required for the Father to watch his only Son bear the excruciating pain of our sin upon the cross. The prophet Isaiah summarized the human condition. We are all like an unclean thing. All our, unrighteous, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Even the high priest Joshua in his exalted position among God's people was clothed in filthy rags before God, Zechariah 3. The apostle Paul who labored arduously to be righteous before God realized that his most strenuous efforts to please God were no more valuable than rubbish. The plight of humanity is that nothing we could ever do could satisfy God's desire for righteousness. But the miracle of God's mercy is that God exchanges our filthy rags for rich robes of righteousness. In this awesome exchange, God placed the sin of humanity upon his righteous son. Jesus became so identified with our sin that scripture says God made him to be sin on our behalf. The Holy Son of God could not possibly do more for us than this. Experiencing the Father's wrath upon the sin he carried would have been more painful to, to endure than any human rejection or physical suffering. Never take the righteousness God has given you for granted. Never take the forgiveness of your sin lightly. It costs God a terrible price in order to forgive you and make you righteous. Walk in a manner worthy of the righteousness he has given you. Would you bow your heads, please? The Apostle Paul says that he, God the Father, made him God the Son, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. My sins were placed upon Jesus at the cross. The sins of the world were placed upon Jesus the Savior. I ask you first of all, do you know Jesus Christ? as your Lord and Savior. Have you come to the point to realize and recognize how I am guilty of sin? Every one of us are. The Bible says, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark of God's perfection. But the Bible says, because of our sins, remember as Isaiah said, our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. We deserve hell. That's what we deserve because of our sins. Oh, but Jesus came that we can have a home in heaven with him, that we can have eternal life a relationship with him. Paul put it this way, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you received that gift? That God, because he loves you, offers? 
He says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friend, you have a choice. Just as Jesus sent out those 70, and as they proclaimed the truth, the people had different reactions. Some welcomed, some believed, others rejected. Maybe you've heard this truth before. But you said no some other time. Friend, I would plead with you. If there's a tugging at your heart, that's called conviction, the Holy Spirit showing you your need. Don't say no. Don't say some other time. But today, now. I'm going to say this prayer that could be called a sinner's prayer. It's not the words. He knows your heart. But you can call out to him and say this to him right now. If you never have, never ask Christ to come into your life. Lord Jesus, today I see that I am guilty of sin. But you love me so much and that you were willing to take my sins upon yourself and to die in my place. You were buried, but you rose again the third day. And right now, I believe I place my trust in you. I ask you to come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior and forgive me of my sins. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In your holy name, Jesus, I pray. With the head still bowed, maybe there's somebody here that says, I earnestly prayed just now and asked Jesus to come into my life. I've never prayed that before. I've never asked Christ to come into my life. Or maybe I've said the words, but I didn't mean it, but just now I did. Is there just a hand raised? I'm not going to embarrass anybody just to say, I just want to know, let you know that I did pray and ask Jesus to come into my life. As we get ready to partake of the elements together, in fact, we do this in remembrance of him. The bread is a reminder of the body of Jesus that was given up for us. The cup is the blood of the New Testament that we have forgiveness of sins because of the shedding of blood. Maybe you're here today as a believer. You say, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I'm saved. I know I have a home in heaven. But I'm just asking you, would you please pray for me this week, Pastor, because I am struggling in my Christian walk. I need personal revival. I'm not as close with Jesus as I once was. I might be reading the Bible, and I might be praying, but I'm spiritually dry. I need revival. Please pray for me before we partake of the elements together, before we have our invitation song, just with a raised hand. Say, and I'm not going to embarrass you, but say, please pray for me because that's me. I'm struggling spiritually. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much. You have called us the ambassadors of Jesus. You are making the appeal through us to be reconciled unto yourself. Lord, if we've come before you with excuses of why we would be silent, Right now, Lord, may we just truly confess our sin to you because you have told us what to do. And may we've been disobedient. We thank you so much for the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus 
May this time, as, as Paul says, may it be a time of examination. Even as we sing and right before we, as we partake of these elements together, may it be a time where we allow you to search us. Where we can say, Lord, would you search my heart? Would you try my thoughts? Would you bring any wicked way to light? And when you do, that I would confess that to you. And it's still the precious blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross that cleanses me as a believer from all sin. Have your way, we ask in this invitation, we pray. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, may they not leave here today without having a relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing?